May we bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, please help us to understand your word and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we're continuing our series from Joshua, and this morning, as you heard, we're studying the end of chapter 5, beginning of chapter 6. The collapse of the mighty walls of Jericho is a fantastic story. People of my generation know the song about the walls of Jericho, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and I think we can get a lot from this story. But as I said a few weeks ago, this is a story that also raises very difficult questions. Had we read on to verse 23, we would have read, Then they devoted to destruction by the edge of the sword all in the city, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep and donkeys. I remember watching a question time when there was a discussion on homosexuality. A Christian brought up uh, what the Old Testament said about homosexuality and the politician Claire Short was there and she was eager to show that anyone with a shred of of morality would not cling to the teachings of the Old Testament. She produced as one of her key arguments that in the Old Testament, God told people to wipe out entire cities, including men, women and children. Her implication was, surely we don't think this is right. Surely we must distance ourselves from the God that we read of in the Old Testament. So what can I say that's helpful on this? I've got a number of brief points. Firstly, there is actually no way of distancing Jesus and the New Testament from God and the Old Testament. God acting in judgment is part of Old and New Testaments. Jesus said some pretty harsh things. And he quoted from these very books of the Old Testament that people attack. Secondly, this part of the Old Testament that is under such scrutiny also contains some of the humanitarian guidelines that have helped frame some of our best international laws. What do I mean? Well, it's the Old Testament that's continually reminding us to be loving and compassionate to strangers and foreigners, that you should give them food and clothing when they're in need. In the book of Deuteronomy, which is where God's people are first told to wipe out the Canaanite nations, we actually read some very different instructions for war. God's people are told, when you draw near to fight a town, first, offer it terms of peace. Second, even if it doesn't submit peacefully, you're not to kill the women, children and livestock. And yet, without embarrassment, side by side with those instructions, the Bible says, but in the case of the nations living in the promised land, you are utterly to destroy them and drive them out. What we're looking in the case of Jericho and elsewhere is, is if you like, a breaking of the normal Bible rules of warfare. What we're looking at at Jericho is the exception rather than the rule. But that still leaves us, why do we have this exception? It was partly due to the exceeding wickedness of the people living there. I think we mustn't be too uh, rosy-eyed about this. Some civilizations in the history of the world have become incredibly corrupt. And this was such a civilization. There was not only uh, sacred prostitution, there was great cruelty, and they would sacrifice their children. They would have their children killed in sacrifice. Sometimes in human history... 
For example, at the flood or at Sodom and Gomorrah, God shows that he will not tolerate human wickedness that so corrupts a whole society. And I'm sure naturally we want to protest and say, but surely God should give such people a second chance. Well, these people had had second chances in abundance. This wasn't a snap decision made on a Monday morning when God was in a bad mood. It had been at least 400 years coming. God told Abraham that he and his descendants would not yet possess the promised land. And one of the key reasons God gives is that the sins of the people living there has not yet reached its full measure. Their hearts were not fully hardened yet. And he tells Abraham there will be a 400 years wait. So by the time Joshua comes along, there's been plenty of opportunity for this people to change their ways. But have they changed their ways? No, not one bit. They've gone deeper and deeper and deeper into a life of sin and it affected everyone. Okay, we say, but surely, surely actually everyone in those nations can't have been so wicked. Well, that's probably true. And we do see God offer a way out. This isn't an ethnic cleansing where God has decided he doesn't like a particular people. This is God acting in judgment against those who have totally and utterly turned their backs on him and who persist in great evil. But God, if anyone will turn to him, he will have mercy. As we saw a few weeks ago, Rahab the prostitute who was living in Jericho chose God's side and the result was she, her family and all who belonged to her were saved. It may look like a total destruction but there was actually a way out of Jericho. And we see this also in Sodom and Gomorrah. There God sent his messengers to see if there were any righteous people left in the city in order to get them out before the destruction came. And God saved Lot and his family. And from the descriptions we know that they weren't particularly righteous people. So it's not as though God sets the bar very high. It's also... As a different point, as you read through Joshua and the next book in the Bible, the book of Judges, although it talks about putting to the sword all the people, it's obvious as you read the narrative that not everyone was killed. Lots of people just fled. So all does not mean every single person. It's like the statement that all of London came to Princess Diana's funeral. Well, we know what that statement means, but it doesn't mean every single person. And in the Bible, we read of Joshua striking round, striking down all in the towns of Debir and Hebron. And yet, strangely, there are enough people remaining to require those very same towns to be reconquered a few years later. I think in all of this, the key to understanding what's going on is to understand what God was trying to achieve. One thing is obviously God wanted to show that he will not sit back idly and tolerate human evil grabbing hold of a society and leading to all sorts of horrors and perversions. He will act in judgment in human history and we should learn the lesson but God was also trying to achieve something for his people the Jews were very weak spiritually they were constantly being led astray by other people's customs and religion in normal warfare God knew that his people would end up intermarrying with the people that they conquered they would end up adopting the very evil ways of those already living in the land. And he didn't want that. He didn't want them taking over those people's way of life. He wanted a new start. 
That's what all this is about. This is a new start for God's people. So he tells them to get rid of it all. They're not even to take over their enemies' possessions and animals. It's a sign that his people were to be pure and not polluted by the surrounding wicked nations. It was God's plan. And yet the sad story of Joshua and particularly Judges is that the people only half-heartedly obeyed God. And they ended up actually falling into the very same behaviour as the people who God had told them to drive out. I'm about to move on to more positive things from this story, but let me finally say on this part of it, the exceptional command to wipe out other nations cannot be used to justify similar actions today. Jesus was very clear that his kingdom is not of this world. There is no nation today that can claim to be God's special people. There's more I could say on this, but if you've got specific questions, do have a word with me after the service. But let's turn to some of the messages in this story of Jericho. Because I think it gives us a tremendous and memorable picture of the relationship between Joshua and God. Joshua was in a tricky situation. There'd been the enormous success that we heard of last week about the people crossing the River Jordan. It had all been very exciting, but it could so quickly turn to disaster because they were now in the heart of enemy camp, enemy territory. The river was behind them, cutting off their escape. They were very vulnerable. They were on level ground. They were an ideal target for the enemy chariots. They needed to get up into the hills where they could be much safer. But blocking the way into the hills was the fortress of Jericho. It wasn't a huge city, but it had been specifically built as a mighty fortress. Now, for you military strategists, you might be thinking, well, why not starve out a fortress? But actually... Joshua didn't have the luxury of time to do this because they were too exposed where they were staying at the moment. Their current camp was in danger. And Joshua faced this this tremendous responsibility for all these people. Leadership does that. It can be quite crushing. St Paul lists this in in the list of difficulties he faced. He says, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. No wonder Paul asks for prayer support. And Joshua, I think, was feeling the weight of responsibility as he took this almost seemingly solo mission to have a look again at Jericho. It must have been very daunting to see such a secure, well-fortified place. Perhaps some of you thinking, but surely Joshua should have been full of confidence. It was obvious God was with him. Look at the way they crossed the river. Of course God would deal with Jericho. Well, for what it's worth, my sympathies with Joshua. One of the things he'd learnt was that God is unpredictable. Yes, during his life he'd seen mighty miracles. In the past he'd led people out to victories because of God's goodness. But there was no comfort zone in this. Who knew what God would do this time? You never quite know what God is going to do. The only thing you were fairly certain of was that it wouldn't be what he did last time or what you thought was a good move. God always has new lessons, it seems, that stretch our faith. There was nothing automatic about taking Jericho. It wasn't something Joshua took for granted. And so Joshua found himself looking at his problem, the walls of Jericho. And you find the passage, it's on the back of the notices that you look at, in verse 13 of chapter 5. He's looking at the walls and probably... The more he looked, the bigger and stronger the walls seemed. 
And probably the more he looked, the more he felt his faith shrinking. And I'm sure that's something you can all sympathise with. Where there's a problem that you're facing, and the more you look at it, it just seems to grow, and your face seems to get smaller. And then Joshua meets this strange figure with a sword. Joshua immediately wants to know, are you on our side or are you with the enemy? And back comes the answer, neither. That has to rate as one of my favourite answers in the whole of the Bible. Whose side are you on, says Joshua? I'm on my own side, is the essence of the reply from God's commander. And I've come to see whether you're on my side. And this is a key lesson, not only for Joshua, but for you and I to learn. We're so keen for God to bless what we're doing. So keen for God to be on our side. And yet the truth is... We're called to be on God's side. It's not the other way round. So often when we face a problem, we come up with our plans. We follow the best thinking that's available to us. The church is tempted to go out and get advice from advertising and communication experts. We learn the best practices from charities and other voluntary organisations. We're eager to grasp keys of success from big business. There's nothing necessarily wrong with doing that, but the prime focus must be God. It's his strategy, his plans. We need to pray more. We need to seek God more, to find out what God's up to, what his side is, and to join him in what he's doing. And God says to Joshua, I'm here. I'm the one who's in charge. And this is the strategy. And God's strategy will often be a complete surprise. It will probably deeply stretch our faith. But it will bring glory to God, not to human cleverness. But even before the strategy is given to Joshua, there's another vital stage... You read in verse 14 of how Joshua bows before the commander of the Lord's army. This figure, this commander, may have been God himself in human form. And he says, Joshua says, what message does the Lord have for his servant? And I think in Joshua's mind he's thinking, all right, now I get the instructions for battle. I mean, Joshua, he must have been so relieved to to meet this commander from God, bearing a sword. Wow, isn't it great? Lord, what have we got to do? Tell me the strategy and I'll do it. And the first command is, we read it in verse 15, the first command, the big strategy is, take your sandals off. The place you're standing is holy ground. Hardly sounds the most helpful thing, does it? If you've got a war to win. But before you can lead God's people, before you and I can do anything for God, first of all, we need to be right with him. To remember who he is. If we're too busy organising and planning and doing and don't have time to be with God and to build that relationship then to be honest, if we're too busy, then the work we do will have little long-term value. We need to meet with our God and to be still and know that he is Lord. When the strategy was at last handed over to Joshua, I think he must have been wondering, why me, Lord? 
Can you imagine you've got your army in front of them and you're addressing them, you know, men, we're going to uh, go out to, to, to win this battle and the Lord has given me instructions. Now, uh, tomorrow you're going to go out and you're going to walk round uh, the walls and there are going to be trumpets and, and then you just come back to camp. And, and the day after, you'd, uh, if, if, if you could just do that again, that would be very good. And yeah, don't remember, don't forget the trumpet. Yeah, I, I want you to do that for six days. Uh, day seven, good news men you can walk round seven times and then we're all going to shout and the walls are going to collapse I wonder what Joshua felt as he said that but in chapter 6 verse 2 before anything on the ground has happened God says to Joshua see I have delivered Jericho into your hands. And, God be- and Joshua believed that promise. It says something about Joshua that he carried out the Lord's instructions to the letter. You and I may face big or small problems in our lives. Joshua teaches us that it's not our responsibility, but our response to God's ability. And as we're learning from the book of Joshua, God's ability is simply incredible. Don't take a long look at the walls of Jericho, says the Lord. Instead, look at me. I'd like you to stay seated for this next song, which I I, I want to be our response to this sermon. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. So we'll stay seated as we sing this.